Hello, everyone. This is Jeffrey Geisner from the Obligations of Memory Podcast Network for the Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembrance. And we're starting episode five with Jackie Gamash from San Diego, and she's a life force. And she's telling us about her new project, We Are the Tree of Life. And I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to talk a little bit about this project, The Tree of Life. And those of you who are interested to see the film, you can actually bring the film up at https vimeo.com and the numbers 49094485. And knowing that this is still in a progress build, we're giving you a sneak preview so that obviously this is going to be a much easier URL to deal with. And those of you who are on YouTube are seeing the pictures, a beautiful picture of the film. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the art that this film contains. And it's sort of an encapsulated view of what we're seeing um, here. And so Jackie, maybe you want to take a few minutes and describe some of the components of what we're seeing on, on screen. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, this is the first image of the movie Carry On presented by We Are the Tree of Life. And uh, it, uh, th that's what personally we call our first image or our poster. Uh, I previously described the tree design by um, my granddaughter, uh, Yvette, and uh, as uh, the representation, as I say, of the leaves are little circles, uh, and uh, the different colors of the roots being brown, deep in the ground and becoming lighter, surrounded by butterflies of all colors and by music. And uh, we we ha all probably have read uh, the poem, uh, uh, I Never Saw a Butterfly. That means that's a representation which drive me to the development and uh, the, the theme and the mission of that initiative. Uh, we were talking about art and uh, here you have, for example, on this uh, little girl were having uh, on her back a backpack and uh, having uh, the uh, attitude and the physical description of walking was uh, from Elga Weisova, who was in uh, Terezin, survived Terezin. And when she arrived in Terezin uh, with her father, her father addressed her by saying, draw what you see. And this kid of 14 years old was uh, very interesting by showing at the beginning the way she sees it, the transcendence of the reality that, uh, that uh, she lives. And this is something very interesting because uh, on, uh, Walking is directed by a sign, like a, a field sign or a street sign, where when she's in camp and when she's in Terezin, she designed herself as a happy girl, a cute little girl, walking back towards Prague. And a lot of the drawings that she did were related to this draw what you see and for example one of her drawing in drawn in the, in the camp also it's two little kid very very colorful dressed playing with snowball and throwing snowball at each other and we know that terezin was not uh, the story that people were living over there uh, is, that, is, that, I, is this girl uh, a survivor or did she perish in Terezin? No, 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 she survived. She survived. Her name is Elga Weisova. Uh, and uh, she, she of course, talked to thousands of kids in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the United States. Her art 
was in exhibition at uh, the Jewish Museum in Prague. And uh, here I want to say thank you to Lynn Kebo that I mentioned, who developed the movie with me as an artist, and uh, to uh, Mr. Hooker, who gave us uh, copies of the art which was in present in exhibit at the Prague Museum. Now, did you meet her? Did you meet her directly? Uh, why so bad? No, no, okay. but I met uh, no, no. Uh, the other thing is, as I say, we were talking about art, we are talking about art here, is uh, the in the center of this uh, image that we, again we call the poster, you can see a dancer flying in the air. And we have represented two stories through a young man, Tamuz Dubnov who lives in Israel, who is a choreographer and a dancer. And represented in the movie, the dance uh, and the circumstances of two dancers. One, Edith Eager, who lives in San Diego, survive the Holocaust and uh, was asked by Mengele himself to dance for him. And Edith was a very, very recognized ballerina before that. And at the moment Mengele asked her to dance, she asked for a word, asked for a presentation, because she talks all over the world, uh, said, I had to make a choice. I dance for Mengele, or I might get killed if I don't dance to Mengele. And she decided to dance for Mengele. And she danced for Margaret and she survived. And uh, the other dancer that we are representing in our movie is uh, Francesca Mann. Francesca Mann has a different story. She was in Auschwitz. She was a very, very recognized uh, ballerina also. And uh, she was entering the gas chamber. And I make those stories short. Uh, she was entering the gas chamber and uh, two uh, Nazis were in the room. I mean, she started to dance. And within her gesture and the, her movements, she grabs the gun of one of the officers and she shot him. And she killed him. And of course, she was exterminated and gassed as all the other women. There were 2,000 women in this room at that point. That means we have, this This is why we are the tree of life, has sense. L let me take it at the human level, the, or the way I feel it. Here are two opposite stories. You make the choice to survive and you say, <laughs> What am I doing here, right? And you have Tammuz, this young man who is probably 28 years old, who is gorgeous, who is in Israel, who made Aliyah, who are dancing with superb beauty, the life of those two inmates. And how that gives a sense to the life of Tammuz, who is absolutely dedicated to the Holocaust and is through his dancing and Holocaust educator. So let me, uh, for me, for me, it's very touching. I'm sorry. So let me ask you um, to go and talk about the music and the art. Right. Here you have the hand of Francesco Lotoro that we have mentioned. Francesco Lotoro went uh, all over uh, the United States, and in fact, all over the world. Uh, he was at Yad Vashem, he, he was uh, in France, uh, and was able to identify music which was composed uh, and hidden in concentration camp and in ghetto. And as I say, uh, in those images which are part of the movie, you can see his hand, he is a pianist, explaining one of the partition and what motivated him to do so. And in fact, his success is to the point that he is building today in his town in Italy, uh, what he calls the Cittadella, which is um, a cultural center 
with the support of the government itself and presenting all his work, which is absolutely beautiful. If uh, talking about art, I would like to go back to the three trees, if I may, Jeffrey. Okay, because what I am saying is everything we do, and we do remembrance. Okay, but when you remember something, you have to give it a sense. Why am I remembering that if I'm not going to use it? And this is what I call my from generation to generation. As I say, the one on the left with the little circle has been done by Yvette. But her little brother, who was uh, probably seven then, did the one on uh, that you can see on the right, where you have those green leaves and a very strong body as the trunk of the tree. And interestingly, I see a face. I don't know if he meant to do that, but for me, I see a face uh, on that tree but, uh, with those little dots and this stain. The other one was made by, underneath, there is another one which was made by uh, Anya, the twin sister, who is very much lighter and a little bit more complicated, not that well defined, as Anya is not defined. She's very determined. She knows what she wants to do. And she is doing that here. And when I presented to Yvette a little bit later, it's the third tree at the bottom on the right. You can see that this tree seems to to suffer, but to win is sufferance. That's the way I see it anyway. The, the, the Some of the leaves are large and yellow. Some of the leaves are very green. The body of the tree, the trunk seems to be strong into the ground. And this is my from generation to generation. I don't know if you allow me to bring the point here of we do need to remember. We do need to know what happened during the Holocaust. But we have to make a lesson of it. We have to make a lesson for our children and for other children and other races. And we have to, to, take, to, to take this suffering and make it, in a sense, a lesson of courage resilience but for the world of today we have a difficult time today and the remembrance is crucial but it has to be according to me oriented to what's happening today in the world and to the respect of the human being by other human being and forget about all this hate and forget about the use of the word hate. We have, and I believe it, and I share it with the ADL. Sometimes you ask me, how do I? ADL has represented itself very, very the anti, anti defamation league with the pyramid of hate. The pyramid is the very green, the image of a pyramid, and how from the bottom of this pyramid, as much as you go up, you meet hate and you learn about hate and we were at a conference when i took this image and i flip it i put the top of the pyramid at the bottom and i say why don't we start with hate and we go to love and forget about hate that means those words that even i use personally like hate hurts uh, no hate again never again, no hate, whatever, I think have to be reviewed. And we have to work by taking all this pass in the sense of educating and towards anti-Semitism and towards racism. It's, we, we are living humanitarian crisis. We are living a humanitarian crisis, and I don't want to hear about politics in Ukraine, 
we are. They are kids who don't have their father. They are wife who don't have that. How can we take what we do for the Holocaust and this remembrance into, into a better respect of each other? And you know, you told me how those ideas come to me. Let, let, maybe I should finish there because that's where I get very emotional. My grandchildren were at my home a few, few weeks ago. And I, uh, play now, I distract myself by reproducing artwork of very recognized artists like Chagall or Picasso, but just, just for fun. And I set up the table downstairs in my dining room with paint and canvases. And my Yvette was drawing the face of a person, dark person, very dark hair, a, a long nose, who was really, I don't want to say aggressive, but who was very strongly personified, but very, very intense. And I said, what are you doing, Vivi? And she said, I don't know, I designed this guy. I say, how do you feel about it? She said, she says, I don't know. I say, you know, Yvette, I just discovered something yesterday that I want to share with you. And uh, she said, what is it, Mimi? I said, I was looking at research of the name of Adam. Adam, she said, I know, I know, I know, I know. He was the first man in the world. I said, yes, he was the first man in the world. And when he's presented in the Garden of Eden, he's effectively the first man in the world. And you spell Adam A, capital A. D A M. Say, I know. I say, but you know, I did not know that through the Bible, we talk about Adam, A D A M, no capital. And Adam is a representation with no capital of mankind. She said, What do you mean? I say, I don't know. But Adam was the first man. He had his life, he did the right thing, he did the wrong thing, he was in the Garden of Eden, but at the same time, you represent humankind. And is it through being similar to Adam that we are going to create this better world that we are thinking about? Or is it not by listening to Adam that we are doing this better world that we are we have been created to perform. And I say, you know, I think that Adam is giving us a match, the image of the responsibility of one individual towards humanity. I feel this responsibility. I don't know how to perform it, but my head is boiling. And if I feel, I feel, I feel close to you, uh, uh, Jeffrey, and I feel with a lot of admiration of what you are doing. And you are doing much more than I do. Okay, you are doing with uh, with your beliefs. You are doing it with the concept of the memory, the remembrance, your family story. I think I'm ready to share something very personal, and but I would like to stop then. Okay. I am a fake. I am a fake. Why am I a fake? Two or three months ago, I was going to Staples to buy some office supply. And when I uh, wanted to park the car, I found a man lying on the cement in the parking lot with his head on the sidewalk as, as his pillow. This man was black of dirt. I could see some of his white skin. It was a white man. He was black of dirt. I went to my car, 
I took a cover for him, a little blanket that I always have in my car. I cover him. I took a $20 bill. I took his shoe, which was sitting next to him, and I put it next to him and holding the $20 bill. And I went to Stables. And I went to Target. And on my way home, I say, I'm going to stop and to see if he's still over there. I mean, I come back. And the man is lying on the floor in the same position. The $20 is here and he's covered with the blanket. And I started to worry. And I say, sir, sir, can you hear me? Can you hear me? He said, blah, blah, blah. I say, can you hear me? And finally, he opened his eyes, the most beautiful blue eyes I have ever seen. Why? I think it was the contrast with the darkness of his skin. And I say, can you hear me? Can you hear me? He opened his eyes and he said, do you have a room for me? I say no, and I left. And this is a traumatic experience for me. How do I said for years, I want to save the world? I create education about Holocaust and education about, about physics and chemistry. You have to go back to this guy we have developed. And when a man asks for help as one individual, I say no. And I went home. Well, we're not going to end this discussion at this point because I have some things to respond to you. Um, I think it's a very fair question that you have proposed to yourself. But I think that you're being uh, much too hard on yourself. I could say that you are probably one in a thousand who went to their car and got a blanket and have, and he has warmth. And you're probably one in 5,000 who would put a $20 bill out of your own pocket and share with him. Now, are you to criticize yourself because you did not offer your home to him? I think that that is a bit of a reach. And I think that I, to, I would, want you to retract the fact that you have said that you're a fake because you are in no way a fake. And I don't think that you should allow yourself to feel in the way you have expressed yourself, which is, which is quite uh, thought provoking. It's evocative from an emotional standpoint. It's, and yes, it has an impact, but I don't think that it is um, I think we all, as a society, need to take that lesson that you just shared with us. It's a but it's a um, Misha Beira lesson, and understand how all of us. Because I can do, the, I can give you the same story from my side. I should be doing so much more than what I'm doing, because I see the same homelessness situation. As I went come into San Diego, which I was there last last week, and I didn't do anything for the homeless. This is a this is a societal problem. It is not invested in you as a solution. And we have to think about. And the one thing that you know, I, I'm not a political person, but I have to tell you this story. Um, so I was putting on a program for the Jewish Holocaust group, which I do monthly. And I find artists to present all around the world. And I had a presentation with um, Jonathan Brent, who is the CEO of the Evo Institute in New York. Yeah. Um, and he um, discussed it. He brought a virtual presentation to our group. And at the end of that presentation, we had a Q and A. And just so happened there were four or five Holocaust survivors in the audience, which there typically is in the in the groups that in the programmings that I put together. And they asked him, uh, some audience member asked him, 
why did he feel there was anti-Semitism, the scaling of anti-Semitism happening around the world today? And without even a hesitation, Jonathan Brent laid the problem at the feet of Donald Trump. And he said, look, it's not um, that anti-Semitism hasn't been here for a thousand years. It has been, but now um, Trump has opened up the manhole covers and given this, uh, given this anti-Semitism and the violent groups and the scourge life and oxygen, and they've coming out of the darkness into the light and they're feeling emboldened. Now, my parents never spoke to me about the Holocaust. I don't know anything about the Holocaust from them, though I do know a lot from my own research um, that I've done since 2020. And, but I had five Holocaust survivors there. And in a sense, I've always asked my, asked and wanted Holocaust survivors to be part of our programming and our group because they act as a surrogate for my parents. I get to understand what the Holocaust was like from their point of view, which had to be very common to my parents' point of view. At least that's my position. And so for some reason, and I don't know why I did it, but I went to each of those Holocaust survivors after Jonathan Brent put his answer out. And I said, how do you feel about Jonathan's question? And I went each of the Holocaust survivors and to a person so that they said the same thing, that they were deathly scared and they were concerned that they never thought in their lifetime they would have another Holocaust, but they are now staring at the fact that they feel there could be another Holocaust in their lifetime. And they are very worried about it. And prior to that experience, um, Jackie, I never posted any political issues. In fact, I, after I came home that evening and I couldn't sleep and I listened to those five people and I went, and I said, These are, this must be how my parents would have felt if they were still living. And I changed, I decided that I had to no longer be silent, that I couldn't in good conscience allow no, no discussion about the causes of anti-Semitism in our group because I was always originally worried that it would cause dissension and people shaming and bullying and everything. And so I changed all the rules of the group. And I now allow political posts, but they have to be respectful because of the survivors have taught me that we cannot be silent. And so I'm coming back to the, the, the story that you just mentioned. We have a collective voice. We are Jews. We are held to a standard and that we need to be able to take our voice and turn it into a vote. And that vote needs to be directed to solving the issues that you're talking about. And there are many of them, from guns, to uh, mental health, to opioid crisis, to homelessness, to lack of housing, to, to you know, you can go on. The world is like uh, in a really not a great place. And not a really great place. You know, I saw a video today that it said, um, it was like, we have a problem and everywhere, every single video was a joke. It was kind of a, a joking video, but it was a newscaster going to all the, all of the various uh, subject matters, guns and going to the reporters and everyone said, we have a problem. Hunger, we have a problem. Homelessness, we have a problem. And I had, I shared this video today. And so I have taken the group into being a very unusual, it's very unusual for the Holocaust group or any group, social group. Um, to be so politically active, but I feel compelled from the survivor perspective that I am touched with to be so proactive and to use the 2,300 members that we have today as a collective voice. And I'll give you another story. There was today a article that circulated and, and I saw it before Olga, um, the, the newsletter Olga Meister came out with that there was a Chilean company um, using an ad to sell alcohol with a anti-Semitic anti trope with the guy with the big nose and money coming out. 
I didn't understand what the Chilean language was, but he was definitely using an anti-Semitic trope and it was written up in this, um, this newsletter. And I made a big deal about it. And I said, we have to stop and boycott this company and stop them from using anti-Semitic tropes. And so I have now 2,300 people. I didn't realize when I started this group a year ago that I would have the voice, the bullhorn that we have. And so we have to use this bullhorn, you and I and everyone else to change the world, to tacuna lum this world. And I think, I don't want you to say you're a fake. You're definitely not a fake. You're one of the most, I, I love working with you. I love being associated with you. And I love bringing your voice and your talent and your projects to the world. And you better not go and talk go to bed at night thinking you're a fake or you ain't no fake. Uh, and I want you to know that from my heart. And so you've been listening to the uh, Obligations of Memory podcast network for uh, the Jewish Culture and Holocaust uh, Remembrance Group. I'm going to give Jackie the very last several words because um, I know she wants to say something. So please, Jackie, and we'll add it on your words. And you shall be a blessing, you shall be a blessing, Lechilo. Very nice. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We have a beautiful series of five episodes with Jackie. And I want you all to remember the We Are the Tree of Life. It will be available to you in a very uh, publicized way, probably this fall. And this episode will run as well. Thanks again, Jackie. We'll see you on the other side.